Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar on using DDA Deconstructing a System Design presented by Jeff Phillips. My name is Laura Lawrence and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harman. So just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a chat function where you can submit questions to the presenters and they'll try to answer as many questions as possible. This webinar is being recorded. The link will be made available a few days after this presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control. And we'd like to encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our learning sessions workshop series on pro.harman.com, as well as visiting Harman Professional University to see our many on-demand and certification courses that are available to you for free. And now I'd like to introduce you to Jeff Phillips, the presenter for today's webinar. Jeff is the Senior Technical Manager for Sound Marketing, Manufacturer's Representative for all Harman Professional Brands, and has also worked with Otari, Radian, BGW, and Viam. Jeff holds degrees in music education and music engineering technology, and is an active musician and producer in Chicago. Assisting Jeff today is Harman's own Keith Caggiano, who will be doing a question and answer style interview with Jeff. So now I'm gonna pass the mic over to you, Keith. All right, thanks, Laura. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for attending. Uh, I'm hoping that many of you uh, attended our previous DDA sessions. So you have a, a basic understanding of what DDA is and what it's used for. Um, today we're going to dive a little bit deeper uh, into a more complex project uh, and we're lucky enough to have Jeff Phillips with us. Uh, he uses DDA pretty regularly um, and he's obviously going to be doing some more complex projects. Uh, he's going to share his experience and expertise with us for the next 45 minutes or so, hour long. Uh, so to begin, Jeff, if you uh, do you want to give us a background of you and what you do? Oh, sure. Um, thanks, Keith. Uh, uh, it, I, within the, the, uh, the sound marketing team, I'm the technologist. Uh, sound marketing is uh, uh, manufacturers reps. We're independent reps. Uh, we happen to uh, represent um, all the Harman brands. Uh, in addition, we, we have other lines like uh, uh, RDL and Purdue Acoustics that we uh, that we represent, um, and Lowell uh, Lowell racks and um, and uh, K and M stands and other stuff stuff that's complementary to the the Harman product line, and um, <clears throat> and uh, within the group, um, you know, it's it's uncommon for uh, for manufacturers reps to have a technologist. Uh, but um, uh, it's it's a great position for me to be in because uh, because although we are a sales organization, uh, you know nothing happens till something gets sold, right? And a lot of times our customers just don't have the uh, the expertise in all of the product lines that uh, uh, that they need to uh, to be able to uh, um, to quickly, uh, especially doing um, uh, sales engineering. You know they have trouble um, knowing where to start and what to put where, and uh, so to reach out to reps that have have you know uh, technical talents uh, is a is a useful thing for them, saves them time and money, and inc improves their accuracy. So <clears throat> that's what I do with both the uh, it, the the Chicago office, which uh, handles Illinois and Wisconsin, and also the Southern California office that handles uh, um, Southern California, Southern Nevada. Uh, I'm really glad you brought that up, actually, that it, you are a bit of a rarity, um, and it is really important that, you know, with the way that technology is heading these days, um, it's it's really important to have resources like Jeff to uh, help steer projects, no pun intended, with these products. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, not every, uh, not every dealer has the design resources uh, or, or really has the time to dive into every manufacturer's technology and get this far into it. And not everybody can afford a consultant to come in and do this work for you. So, you know, whether it's going to the manufacturer or having a great resource like Jeff, uh, it's a really important thing to have, I think. So thank you for that, Jeff. Um, so, uh, so I guess let's, uh, let's just dive in. What's, uh, what's the project that you want to present today? Well, I want to I want to show you a music theater, and I'm gonna I'm gonna exit the the PowerPoint slide there for a minute, and hopefully bring up a. You're probably seeing a preview slide of the uh, or a slide of a uh, of a music theater here. Yeah, we got that. Okay, good. Uh, this is a music theater, um, and um, uh, uh, that that approached us um, back in January, saying, "Man, our our music just kind of." Sucks. 
<laughs> to put it bluntly, um, we we don't um, we uh, we have uh, patients complaining, and uh, they recently went to a different format. You know, like you might expect for a small theater. Look at this. Look at this. It's a very very tall theater. Uh, nobody's more than like 50 feet away from the edge of the stage. It's really cool, uh, <clears throat> but it's also uh, it's got uh, two balconies and it's um, a very high space. So um, uh, we. They, they, they said, look, we're doing more and more musicals because musicals are where it's at. Musicals bring us people and musicals bring us subscribers. You can probably tell what musical this one is here. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so uh, they brought me in. I looked at this, took a, I took a number of pictures. I took a little wraparound video too and just wanted to remind myself what this place looked like and it's just, Man, oh man, this is a fantastic little space. I want this for my theater. I want, <laughs> I want to own this place. And yeah. I'm sure they would love that too. You know, hey, look, big donor. All I need, to, <laughs> all I need now is the money. Um, <laughs> note that uh, the the pit. Uh, you only see about five feet of the pit. The rest of the musicians are underneath the stage. Uh, yeah. Coming out through uh, through this this uh, wonderful little hole. Uh, another thing, a couple other things I want to point out. Here's the edge of the proscenium, and you can see a work light right there. Right beyond the work light is a place where they said, uh, you know, it would be a beautiful place to put loudspeakers, right? And they said, absolutely not. No, you cannot put speakers there. Actors, actors like to hang out right there. They like to come in and out of this uh, of this door here, and 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 uh, do uh, asides and sidebars and soliloquies right from that spot. You cannot put loudspeakers there. It's like, uh, yeah, probably if, if actors are standing there, I don't want to put loudspeakers right in, anyway, yeah. right, right in back of them either. So, yeah. oh. so stop it already. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Why don't I just turn my phone off? I think do I, I, don't, I don't think I've ever turned my phone off. You, get one, uh, you get one hour of uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I slid my phone. Actually, we're, we're, we're good now. Sorry about that. Uh, so, so I cannot put loudspeakers there. Uh, I said, well, okay, well, can I put them up here? They said, well, uh, this uh, this proscenium is is concrete. So unless uh, and we don't want anything on the outside of it because it's kind of a high finish place, a lot of old wood. This place yeah. is over 100 years old. So probably not there either. I said, um, geez, guys. So let me get this straight. And this is, you, those of you who have done sound systems a lot before, you'll understand this. Let me get this straight. You want all the sound and never see the loudspeaker, right? Most common yeah. requirement. Okay. <laughs> you never want to, uh, so you want, you want magic to happen here. Uh, yeah. Can you have lighting and not see the fixtures? Well, this is kind of a little bit different proposition because the fixture, lighting fixtures, you know, that they're, they're, they're behind and, People don't look at them, but um, in order for the for the people to hear the sound, they've you got to see the speakers. People have to be in in you know hopefully in uh, line of sight to a loudspeaker in order to get the the most out of uh, hearing that loudspeaker. Yeah. So okay, I can't put it here. I can't put it here. I can't put it. Can I put it here? And I said, huh? Yeah, I think so. Now um, I might highlight right here. Uh, this is a uh, JBL Eon 10, uh, 610 uh, powered loudspeaker, and you can't see it, but there's another one up there, and there's another one over here. They they rent they went real um, music store on us uh, for their previous sound system, and it's it's those are while those are great speakers, this is not the proper application for these loudspeakers. So they came to us and said, hey, you know, shoot us some some uh, idea of what to do here. Um, and so um, this is this is a really tricky room, guys. And and uh, I didn't know how I was going to handle this. Um, so as as you might expect, or it, it, well, as you will soon to be expecting out of me, when I don't know what loudspeakers to put where and how to aim them, I model the room. And and that's what DDA is good for. Let me bring up my Windows machine here within my Macintosh. Okay. And so while you're while you're switching to that, I'll I'll cover the kind of preliminary DDA questions then here on on you know why you're choosing it and you know initially for those of you that don't know DDA was designed as a tool for Intellivox products. Uh, the the initial goal was to be able to 
build a 3D model and, and do the beam shaping and beam steering that you need to do for the IntelliVox products. Um, so the, the big question is, uh, you know, are you, is your intention to just be using IntelliVox in this space or, or are you open to others? Why, you know, why DDA for this application? Oh, my links are going to be wrong. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you've got to, I mean, the alternative to, uh, to something like DDA is to use something like um, Ease, but do you want to be spending, you know, minimum of 650 bucks? Uh, do you want to spend, you know, a month learning how to use it? Uh, just to draw a room and and put a loudspeaker in and point it and make sure you're um, you're you're putting it in the right place and and, and pointing it the right way. Sure, I don't think so. Um, not when there's an alternative. And um, and uh, Keith, remind me how how much DDA costs? Uh, I believe it's zero dollars. <laughs> zero dollars, right? You know, and uh, is it is it exclusive to JBL products? It is not. It is not. It's anything that uses a that any manufacturer that has CFL. Uh, CLF, sorry, data for their loudspeakers you can use in here. Yeah, no CFLs. Those are compact fluorescents. <laughs> you cannot model those in DDA. But yeah. you can model just about any loudspeaker uh, from a manufacturer that, that publishes C, uh, CLF, common loudspeaker format uh, files for uh, that loudspeaker. So uh, I'm going to save you about, uh, I, I okay, you know, Come, become the uh, coronavirus in isolation. I had plenty of time to work on this model, right? Your models are not going to look like this. You're not going to get this complicated with models. And it's taken me a long time to do this. But uh, here is that same space that you saw, except now I've got it, um, I've got it, a cartoonish version of it. And yeah, we're, so, uh, we're not in DDA yet for anybody that's following along. This is, this is now SketchUp. So we're going to get into the actual building of the model that will be used in DDA at this point. Precisely. Yes. One of the things that's one of the things that's coolest, I think, about uh, DDA is that you can draw in SketchUp. You don't have to. You can draw right within DDA, but it's like define a point, define a point, define a point, define a point, um, make a surface out of it, go to the next surface. And if you look at how many surfaces I have in this model, it, quite would, a while. it would take you a long time and a lot of a lot of hand calculations. So um, so uh, instead, I. And I put a, uh, I put, who, who's this? Let me see. That's, uh, what's her? Oh, she doesn't have a name. Uh, let's call her Laura. Uh, here's Laura right here standing in the corner. And this is Chris. I think this is Chris. Yes, his name is Chris. You can see right there. It says Chris. Um, I put a couple of people in the model. Just I put, I put her here just to remind myself not to put a loudspeaker there. Um, so, oops. All right. If you ever are doing SketchUp and uh, and you get lost like inside of a wall, you don't know where you are, you hit this little button right here. Zoom to extents there, yeah. Zoom extents, and and then now you're now you're backed out to uh, to where you can see things. So, so how yeah. long did it take you to build this model, and how long have you been using SketchUp? Well, um, I've been using SketchUp. Uh, good question. Um, uh, First, uh, Sketch, I'm, using, I'm using SketchUp uh, 2017. Why 2017? A, it's free. You can still, if you go to, uh, if you, if you uh, do a search on the terms uh, SketchUp 2017 download, you can find it. It's on the legacy page. And I use tw uh, SketchUp 2017 because it's still free. Uh, you can download it and uh, provided you're not making any money with it, you can, uh, you can keep using it for forever. Um, it's not updatable, uh, but you don't care. Um, and also, also, and very importantly, um, when you do a model in SketchUp, obviously, it's going to be important to export it to DDA, right? And there's this little um, uh, uh, RBZ, uh, an extension to uh, SketchUp that you can install called um, SU4AC. Um, uh, I think we'll uh, you'll you'll find that on the JBL site too as a download. Yeah, that's all available there, and there is an update to that one as well that does work with 2019 if you do have the the pro version of SketchUp. Yeah, yeah if you end up using this a lot, then, then great. But back to your question, uh, I've been using this since uh, uh, I went on vacation with uh, we we went to visit my my wife's uh, family in with uh, in um, uh, in Virginia. And um, all the ladies went out and did their shopping like every day. They seemed to have plenty of things to talk about and plenty of things to do. Meanwhile, there was um, 
uh, it was me and then my, my brother-in-law. My brother-in-law, because it's, it's Thanksgiving vacation, wanted to spend all day up in a tree hunting deer, and <laughs> that was not welcome. Uh, so I, luckily, I had written down a lot of dimensions of, uh, of, my, of my house, our house, and, um, and so I, I used that, that alone time uh, on, uh, sitting at their dining room table learning SketchUp by drawing my house. And I have a killer representation of, of my whole house with property and elevations and trees and, and everything like that done in SketchUp. And it's, you know, for those of us who have no life, that's uh, it's a really good way to spend some time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I, I guarantee you that uh, the time you spend uh, messing around with, with SketchUp and learning how to draw, it, yeah. at first glimpse, it seems, especially those of you who know AutoCAD, um, AutoCAD is extremely precise and, uh, and you know, you, you know, reference lines and dimensions and repeatability and, and do an array of circles around this circle and stuff like that. Um, this is not that. Um, however, at, and at a first glance, it might seem imprecise, but I swear you can get as precise as you want to get. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. The, the nice thing about SketchUp is you can get as precise as you can, as you need to, but you don't have to. And I think that's the key thing. Whereas a lot of these other programs, you really do have to be that precise, and it takes a lot of time to do it. Right. You I do. Uh, I, I won't do a, a wood a woodworking project anymore without first drawing up the parts in in SketchUp. Yeah. And um, and you know make draw a part, make a group, draw a part, make a group. Then I can assemble all those onto um, into a plane and see how many sheets of plywood and I need to buy things like yeah. that. Uh, it's it's very very usable, and the the time you spend learning SketchUp will will be worth it. Uh, yeah. Plus, you can make these cool models. Now, keep in mind. The, the goal, there's actually a two, uh, um, two-fold go uh, goal to doing DDA, right? One is to make sure you've, uh, to let you play around and make sure you put the loudspeakers in the right position or aiming them and powering them at the right levels. A equally important is the idea that you will have a deliverable to your yeah. client that proves to them that you know what the hell you're doing <laughs> <laughs> you're, you've done your research, you've done your homework, you're giving them the exact right uh, um, um, uh, loudspeaker plan, uh, choice placement and, and powering uh, that's going to give them the best results for their property. Okay, now, so that gets to the point of how much detail do you put into a drawing? Well, if it's me, you put in a lot of detail because, because you can and it's, it's comfortable and, and I've got the experience of doing so. Uh, I would recommend that you want to put as much detail into a into a into a uh, SketchUp model um, as required to so your client can relate to the model. Okay, when I show this model to the to to my client, there is no question that I've drawn their room. It's not just some generic rectangle, right? It's their room. So you want to put enough details. You want to put doors where doors go, and you want to put uh, you know windows where windows go, and enough, uh, enough um, features of the model so that the client looks at it and says, oh yeah, that's my room. I can, right. I can, and they can imagine themselves walking in. And when you do the plot, they can almost feel the, the sound pressure on the, on the floor or on the seating plane or on the uh, listening plane. Interesting, all right. Okay, so, so here's the model uh, and it's got different layers. I, I, start, I started out with the plan. Uh, let's see if I can show you just the plan. Yeah. yeah, here's the floor plan and then I build up from there. Anyway, so you, with, uh, you started with CAD or you started with a PDF and just build off of that? Well, uh, typically what I'll do is, um, uh, you know, if I, if I get the AutoCAD plan, then fine. In fact, this one did come from, uh, from AutoCAD. So I'll, I'll bring that up on screen uh, uh, make it uh, as big as I can, take a screenshot of it. Yep. And of course, within AutoCAD, I know that the distance from here to here is 53 feet. Yeah. So now I, in the SketchUp, I just uh, create an object that's 53 feet long and then scale the drawing up until it's that. And now everything is gonna be proportional. And now I can grow my room up, I can grow my seating planes. The um, uh, rake ceiling planes, uh, seating planes are the worst. Yeah. I've got some tricks, but they are uh, they are a bit of a challenge. 
Yeah, yeah, it's it's very interesting you say because that's that's my exact process as well. You take something as precise as AutoCAD and then you screenshot it and do some <laughs> some estimated uh, scaling to get things the way you want it. <laughs> right. now, now the cool thing for an acoustical model, if you're off by half a foot in a hundred foot room, yeah, it really doesn't matter much. much. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, so um, so anyway, uh, I think I, Keith, did, did we have we said enough about models. I think so. Yeah. Why don't we move on to DDA? Um, okay. Obviously, for all of you at home, uh, we're not going to build this room because that might take a little bit too long. But the the object here is to see how specific you can get and how complex of a project you can you can do in both SketchUp and DDA. So so yeah, let's go ahead and look at uh, what this looks like in DDA and how you use it there. All right. I have to do this a little bit differently because. I had moved my files, and if I don't move them back to where they were, then I'm going to have to relink everything. So I think I think we should be okay. All right, launching DDA. Uh, version 5.1 came out uh, just a couple months ago, and if any of you have ever tried to use DDA in the past, you know that it was an it was a it was definitely free. It was taxing in that you had to, yeah, every no six problem. months, go through this really complicated relicensing procedure. And, and it was just a, uh, it, it was it was a time suck and it was it was aggravating. You had to copy these numbers and paste them into an email and send it off and, and yeah. wait for someone to get back to you with your unlock code and junk like that. That doesn't have to happen anymore because this version 5.1, it's still coming up by the way, uh, version 5.1 is is all about um, 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 ease, really. It uh, it it just it it's easy to uh, just download it, put it up. It's a one-time licensing. Click the li yes, I agree to this licensing term, and you know, forget all the fine print. Yeah. And there you go. It takes the uh, first time you launch, um, it takes a while to come up. It is coming up. Yeah, uh, yeah. A, a for, for anybody that may have had frustrations in the past with previous versions of DDA, um, there was, uh, you know, a fairly uh, lengthy registration process for it. And uh, just so that you know the background on that, all of the IntelliVox algorithms and modeling that happens, uh, it, you know, is is all that code is is in DDA. So it was important for us to keep track of, you know, who was using this and make sure that it didn't just go unattended. Um, so that's that's really the background for that. Uh, at this point, uh, we have made it safe for us and also fully free uh, and available. So, okay. So uh, now, normally, uh, the, in the procedure uh, that you would follow in in doing a, um, and I, I teach this in my course. Course is AD one forty four. By the way, um, is a it's a seven a Vixa credit course. Uh, that takes us through actually drawing rooms in SketchUp, and then we use the SU4AC thing to export them. <clears throat> and at, this is the point where you would be, um, you'd be going here to the and creating a geo file that matches the room, and then um, and queuing it up and saying OK. And then that's what brings the the model into DDA. And Keith, I've noticed a, a slight anomaly with uh, with DDA, uh, this latest yeah, version. Yeah. When you launch it for the first time, um, and after it goes through its drawing procedure, it'll, you may see nothing. Yeah, yeah, it's a scaling thing. It depends on the resolution yeah. of the screen. Yeah. 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 In this case, it uh, it actually worked. Okay, so yeah. that's good. If you see nothing after you've drawn, if you if you hit this button and, and you've drawn, you build your model and you don't see anything, you try sizing the window just a little bit. Yeah, and, it and, and it pops up. So it that'll be corrected in a future thing. But yes. Okay. So now you can see how many surfaces there actually are, and um, the, the the next thing you do once you've got the model into your um, uh, uh, into into DDA is to define what the seating planes are, and once you've done that, then they will turn gray in the model. Now I notice that as I spin this around, it's taking the surfaces that I've that I'm looking at the back of, and it's making them transparent, so I can see. Like I can see right through the uh, um, uh, through the um, right, right, stage yeah. area, right? But I turn this way now, and it's now it's different, and now I can see through all these walls. Now um, the way SketchUp makes uh, curves is it, it's actually a bunch of segments that are that are close together. That's why you see all these vertical lines here, and that's a bit of a bit of a problem. But you know, not too much. So, um, all right. So now comes the task. How do I 
get sound to everybody. I took <laughs> a few to go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, you know, what, obviously we talked a little bit about, you know, the restrictions you had in, in place in them, but when you first started with this, did you know exactly where you wanted to go? I see a center cluster there. I see some sides. Oh, um, um, no. What was the first explanation here? And again, was it in Televox or were you looking at something else initially? Well, that's uh, the part of what we're going to be talking about. Uh, I looked at a bunch of things. I, I didn't know what was going to be working here. Um, I did, you know, to... Um, um, uh, just so you know that um, uh, I was able to um, do this with Intellivox, and then I brought that back to the uh, to the owners, and they said, "Yeah, we don't have that kind of money." <laughs> <laughs> Not that Intellivox costs a lot. I mean, considering you're getting you know up up to 16 channels of amplification and processing within each okay. unit. And that's stuff that's gear that you don't have to build a rack for and integrate and get cabling to. Uh, no, no, no. Um, it's 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 actually uh, Intellivox is a pretty good solution as, uh, to an integrator uh, from an overall cost standpoint, um, from a full cost standpoint. But it 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 was it was too much for this project. Uh, okay. Up on something else. Um, yeah, but they they want to be they they thought. You know, the owners have an idea, right? And, and then, you know, sound guys talk to sound guys and, and, they, uh, and, and they're like, okay, well, uh, sound crew, what do you think? What do you think is gonna be, work? well, I think we ought to have this. Ah, oh, I think we ought to have that. You know, they try, they try different ideas out. And the idea that they had come to was that we do a center, uh, center cluster. Right. And where, did they have a, uh, not plugging JBL or Harmon here too much, but uh, did they have a preference and did you push them to, to JBL or do you consider other manufacturers when you're doing these in DDA or what's your... Oh, great question. Um, well, you know, I, I, we, we rep JBL, um, but I, as, you know, in my, in my technical role, I'm never going to recommend a JBL speaker if... Uh, if they're, if it's not the right choice for the uh, for the project, you know, I'll often you know, if if they start if they say we don't know what we want here, let us let it you know you will let you choose. I mean that's that's what we're asking you in for. Uh, then uh, I've got so many loudspeakers I can choose within the JBL family that I I rarely have to go outside of that. Uh, uh, but you know sometimes you know they'll say well I've already got this and this speaker, I want to reuse them. You know, owner furnished equipment, right? Sure. So, um, so I will I will drop those into the model, and provided they'll actually do the job, I will I will uh, approve them for you know uh, for use, or I'll I'll put my my blessing on them. Uh, I've had to do that occasionally with uh, with community loudspeakers and with uh, Danley and and uh, EAWs, um, uh, a bunch of different things, um, and and it's really interesting to put other people's loudspeakers in um, in the same model and see if they actually do what they the, the manufacturer says that they're going to do. Because yeah. CLF files, common loudspeaker format files, you can't just go out and say, look, here's my speaker and here's what it does in space. Yeah. No, that data must be vetted by, uh, by an independent committee. Yeah. So you can trust a CLF file to really tell you what a loudspeaker is going to do. Yeah, and these are it's also important. The, the CLF files are done by the manufacturers themselves. These are not files that we're saying, "Hey, here, go ahead and model somebody else's speaker in our program with our files." It's you know, this that's all that's all right. Independent. Each manufacturer submits their their uh, their data, uh, their polar data on their loudspeakers, and then that data is vetted by an independent. Yeah. So um, so I like that, and and I, it was really surprising, especially with Danley. You know, they 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 wave their hands a lot about uh, how great their speakers are. And, and then you put them in the model and it's like, I could have done that with a JBL PD. I could yeah. have done that with a large format EAW. I, yeah. you know, it's like, uh, <laughs> so um, the question came up, uh, I just saw a question flash up there about uh, who vets the, um, the, the um, CLF, uh, CLF files. There, I, you know, it's, I, I forget, Keith, but I, I knew this at one point. Maybe we can get back to you, you know, toward the end, toward the end of this thing to to uh, to confirm that. Uh, I'm going to keep going with this, but we'll uh, we'll try to research that and let you know. There is a there is a um, there's an ORG that, uh, that takes care of this. Anyway, back to the model. Um, so uh, the in this case, in the case of this music theater, 
uh, the owners had this grand idea that all they need is a center cluster. And their sound guys were saying, all we need is a center cluster. Well, if you look from the standpoint of the center cluster, you can't see half the seats in the place. There's no place you can put a, a single cluster to, uh, uh, to be able to see all the seats. So that didn't work. That did not fly. Uh, I can, in fact, let's try that. Um, I think as I'm going to interject really quick. So uh, uh, just to go back to answer that question and get, a, get it off our plate, uh, clfgroup.org. Uh, so the measurement has to be done by an independent service and verified. So there you have it. Sorry, continue. Okay, no, no problem. Uh, that's that's useful because now it's it's drawing and it uh, because this is a large model, it takes a while to draw. Uh, and if you put a center cluster, guess what? You, you don't you don't get to see a whole lot. Uh, it's lighting up the uh, the seats now. The blue areas are shadows. I have the shadows turned on, so. Uh, but you'll see that it uh, the the front seats in each balcony uh, get addressed pretty well. Uh, especially that that first balcony gets uh, treated pretty well. If we look down on, sorry, uh, let's hit the X Y V button here. Oh, come on back here. <laughs> if you look down on the orchestra level, well, we hit the balcony really well, and the people in the back of the orchestra that you know underneath this balcony uh, get to see get to hear pretty well. But everyone in the first ten rows is kind of underserved, right? Yep. That that ain't gonna work. Um, so then, let me see what else did I try? Uh, and I tried um, in some IntelliVox. Let's go. Let's try some IntelliVox speakers now. Um, going back to the um, ISO view. Yeah. I just want to point out really quick here, if you guys are using DDA for the first time, or if you took my course uh, last week, uh, you're going to notice a few more uh, icons that are available in Jeff's uh, model here. Uh, that's because he's done what's called a full run, uh, and he's he's actually compiled all of the uh, all the full algorithms and everything for IntelliVox, and so these, these last icons that he's highlighting here are, are available in here, um, which gives you frequency traces and, and measure of microphones and those those kinds of options. Yeah, exactly. Um, let's try another uh, on another approach here. Let's try just group A. Now, group, yeah, uh, unfortunately, there's no way to name the group, so I had to write myself a cheat sheet on here. Group A <laughs> is some IntelliVox um, just on the lower level. Let's see what that does. Doop -doo -doo. My computer is doing about 16 things right now, so sorry, it takes a little bit longer. You see now, uh, putting a pair of, of, of pair of loudspeakers right here, tucking it right up to this corner, we're still out of the way of the, the actors who stand right there, but now our orchestra coverage is really pretty good. So that's a good which, start. Uh, and which models do you have? What uh, um, IntelliVox models do you, do you try in there? Uh, well, the only one that would fit. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> the, the one. Uh, this is a DSX 180, which is 1.8 meters tall. And I, some, uh, Jeff's doing a really cool trick here, which is he's got the he's got it inverted. Yes, um, he's got the acoustic center at the top of the column, um, which is a, a really cool trick because it, it gives you the height that you need in restricted areas like this to get it above uh, the audience, the listener plane. So very yeah. Nice. And that worked pretty well. So, so my next step was to try to uh, try to do that times uh, the three levels. So, if we do groups A, B, and C, to do to do, takes a while to calculate this, and it'll take a little bit longer to draw it. But uh, uh, stacking them up vertically. The other thing I was thinking of is you can get into, you can get IntelliVox uh, painted uh, from the factory to to match an RAL RAL color. Uh, color chip and um, if in, in a in a vintage place like this particular theater, I wanted something that was not going to be offensive um, uh, aesthetically. And what could be least and you know and what what I found is in Televox speakers because you can mount them flat against the wall and use the the um, the intelligence of the of the speakers to to aim them and and shape the response to the shape of the uh, a seating plane. Um, 
they become, you know, they're flat against the wall. If they're flat against the wall, you look at them once, you say, oh, there's a loudspeaker, and then you never look at it again. Uh, it's not distracting is as much as a loudspeaker that's actually tilted. Um, so I, I went with that first, and the seating cover, this cover is, is really pretty darn good. I want to point uh, out something else, because there's going to be some people at home that are saying, that coverage isn't really that good. Um, so for all of you that were just thinking that, I'll, uh, however many of that you are, uh, if you look at the measurement that Jeff's using right here, this is a female speech frequency range. Um, so there is a lot of low frequency energy that is being calculated in this particular model. If you were to switch this up to 1K or 2K, you're going to see very different coverage, but it may not be accurate to the uh, application. So uh, it's important whenever you're doing any kind of modeling like this, you got to look at what's what's appropriate for the specific application and also what's going to really tell you what the coverage is doing. So it, it's good to get both ends of the spectrum. Um, a weighting is, or full, you know, pink noise, uh, A weighted is fine, but it's not giving you really anything specific. Uh, so it's good to jump around quite a lot. Yeah, and you have the option to do that. There's no extra charge. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I do use female speech, uh, in male speech, ISO uh, standard um, uh, male speech uh, as a frequency uh, average is included in, and you can model with that too. The uh, difference between male and female is that uh, male ex extends down a little bit further in low frequency um, and, and has, has a presence peak a little bit different spot. Well, female speech. What do I do to male speech? I roll off the low frequencies anyway, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then I put a, a little uh, uh, a bump in the uh, in, in the uh, in the speech yeah. anyway. So <laughs> my female speech ends up spectrally looking more like female speech anyway. Male speech ends up looking like female. So uh, that's what I use for my primary modeling. But yes, you're right. I if uh, depending on the application, I will do a frequency run and and take a picture of of all of those different frequencies and send that back to the client just so they have a especially if they if they understand if they just need an idea of where to put the loudspeaker and how to aim it and what's going to end up like and if the if the uh if the uh, AV integrator just needs a deliverable to put in their package to say we've done our homework we've chosen these speakers here's what it's going to look like uh then then I'll probably just do female speech as an average uh, but if they if they really understand then I'll give them a whole frequency run Okay, so here's another problem with that. Um, I am getting ooh, a little bit over 100 uh, dB uh, if you're right next to the loudspeaker, but it's going down to, I, I don't like, there's too much variation in level. I'm not getting enough uh, level into the back seats. I'm not sure I can, given the constraints that, uh, uh, that I had in this job, but uh, I'd like to get a little bit more than, than 80, 90. Here's, so I'm getting like 87 dB in some of the back seats. Now, keep in mind, this is important about DDA. It's measuring direct field only, okay? So if you can get a really even direct field coverage, then chances are your overall coverage, including reflected energy, is going to be even more even, okay? Um, so your results are always worst case uh, in what you're looking at here in DDA. Um, your, uh, if once you factor in the uh, the total SPL, then and you have a, 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 a over here on the left, I could click on total SPL and it would show you a pretty darn even coverage because it's factoring in other other things. But uh, I, it, your goal is, as a as a designer is to try to get the maximum evenness of direct field. And I'm not too her too terribly uh, pleased with this. I think we can do better than this. Um, not sure we can. Um, so I, I tried some other things, and um, let's see. I think it's uh, you already saw the center cluster. I mean, you knew that that didn't work. Um, so I think my last grouping was group E here, and this is um, uh, I believe I used uh, CBT one one hundreds. CBT one hundred LA is a um, Oh no, this is not right. <laughs> no, that's back to center cluster again. Uh, what did I use here? I forget. Um, hmm. Well, um, shoot, I might not be able to show you, uh, but my uh, my final solution for this room um, that actually met the budget of the customer was CBT 100s, and um, I used the same positioning that I used for the um, 
uh, for the um, um, DSX 180s, meaning one here, one here, and one here. Plus, I had another one at this same spot facing the orchestra side. So uh, we found that we could use uh, four pair of CPT 100s um, and use them. Use the flush mounts. You know, CPT 100s come with a reticulating mount. You can you can pan. Uh, almost 180 degrees, you can tilt up or, or down 15 degrees maximum or anything in between. Um, I, I didn't use those. There's an alternative bracket you can get for CBTs that is a, is a keystone mount. So you mount one side flush against the wall, mount one side on this speaker and you just go clunk and then there's a set screw you can, you can keep so it doesn't get bumped off the wall. Uh, I use those um, directly against the wall. Not quite as clean and, and, and uh, uh, as an appearance as if, as if I had used the DSX 180s, but next closest thing. Um, and the, the CBTs uh, come in either white or black from the factory. Uh, they are paintable. They got a really fine mesh grill though. So what you want to do is, is you know, spray those with whatever paint and then hit it with the air gun and clear out all is very important clear out all the all the grill holes so there's no paint gooking up the uh, the, the holes in the grill uh, but they can be mount they can be painted and there's a there's a tech note in fact there's a tech note that is downloadable from JVL on how to prime them how to treat them how to keep the grills clean um, so that's what I ended up with this and if if you'd like Keith I can explore around and see if I can find I have to get a different version of the model up um, I think that's all right. I think we get get the, idea. Get the idea. I was actually gonna yeah, I was gonna actually ask uh probably more specifically on the Intellivox, but um as you're going through this, you know, are there what kind of tricks do you use to get to kind of force the coverage that you want or you know, to really get what you're looking for in terms of weighting or, you know, SPL requirements and those kinds of things. Well, uh, it's it's a little bit different when you're de uh, dealing with Intellivox than when you're dealing with the point uh, point source speaker. Uh, sure. For instance, um, in Intellivox, um, DDA actually does all of the math behind the things. It's based on MathCAD and uh, or Mat uh, from MATLAB MathCAD. So. Um, if you are familiar with that program, you know that it's just a, an incredible resource in terms of, um, of uh, you know, doing all the all the fancy math behind uh, three three D geometry and and um, and such. Uh, actually, uh, the uh, the technology that we're looking at here with DDA, the genesis of that began in the lighting field, and so there are a lot of lighting esque um, features to the to the models. Uh, if any of you have used um, a lighting design programs, um, it's it's all the same sort of technology. You've got a source, it's got a particular pattern of radiation, and uh, it's got an intensity to it, and it's all vector math. So MathCAD takes care of all that back in the in the back. DDA, uh, I mean, sorry, um, uh, the Intellivox DS and DSX series loudspeakers. Uh, rely on DDA to achieve the absolute maximum uh, result because it uses MathCAD to come up with all the filter coefficients. I mentioned earlier that a, a given um, um, Intellivox loudspeaker will have either eight or 16 channels of amplification and processing in it. Well, what the uh, what the, uh, DDA does, if you're if you're modeling and, and planning to use a DDA, uh, uh, an Intellivox loudspeaker, it'll come up with what Keith mentioned is a full run um, and then that full run will include all of the fancy um, um, uh, 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 filter coefficients uh, and, and delay coefficients for uh, for the Intellivox so that it, it can match its response the best it can to the defined seating planes. Now, it, you mentioned tricks. There are tricks within DDA uh, that you can use to, to kind of skew the math a little bit in your favor. For instance, if you had a balcony face, I've got three, well, two balcony faces of consequence right here and here. If I needed to avoid that, that balcony face, because I knew I was going to get a nasty reflection, I could reduce the energy that's hitting that balcony face by making that face a high priority for a lower SPL. And I can play games that way. And in, 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 in doing so, it'll change the polar pattern of the loudspeakers so that 
um, so that it puts less energy on the balcony face. That's yeah, pretty cool. I like to uh, when I when I'm talking about Intellivox, I, I like to end NDDA along with it. I like to refer to it as kind of reverse engineering. Usually, when we're thinking about uh, system design, loudspeaker use, uh, we're thinking about here's my speaker, this is its coverage pattern, I'm going to point it over here. Uh, DDA is kind of doing the complete opposite of that. You're saying this is my room and this is where I'm going to mount a, a speaker, tell me what's possible, you know, and, and then, you know, to Jeff's point there, you can you can detail certain areas in the room saying, well, I don't want energy on this surface or I do want more energy on this surface than that one, and you can tailor it to contour the coverage pattern to that. Um, so it takes a little bit of the guesswork and, and kind of uh, happenstance out of the process. You know, if you use, if, uh, if you guys are used to using standard line arrays or, uh, or just basic beam steering products uh, that are all over the market these days, uh, it's it's a lot of just chance work. It's a lot of well, I'm gonna try aiming it this way. I'm gonna try splitting my boxes this way and see what the what changes. And you know this really takes a lot of that out of it because it's it's starting you right off the bat with this is really what's what physics allowed to uh, to happen. And then you can try and tweak it from that point. Um, so I think there's there's some ways that DDA is really really fast, specifically with Intellivox, but then also when you're Comparing it to other products, if you want to do CBT versus Intellivox side by side, it's really great to see that and uh, and get the comparison or other manufacturers, whatever you want to do. So, yeah. Very, uh, uh, very important. Yeah. Um, you can also do virtual planes uh, because uh, you mentioned uh, um, the line array calculators. Uh, a, a lot of times it's really useful to see where you know, the ultimate pattern is coming off of the line array. Um, or with the CBTs, if you use the CBT calculator, it's a vertical slice, right? Or if you use um, ease focus, same sort of same sort of thing. Well, in DDA, you can actually do that. You can put in a virtual plane that is right at the at the axis of the loudspeaker and facing out into the audience, and and you can see projected on that plane. Uh, although it's not a reflective surface in the program, it just shows you what the what the uh, what the propagation is off that loudspeaker, what the coverage is. Yeah. Uh, that's really cool. And it's also, uh, in this model, um, uh, it might be important to note that uh, the lower set of loudspeakers, I said, okay, this seating plane is your target. These speakers, this seating plane is your target. These speakers, this one is. So uh, so I didn't have it. Uh, it if you do that, then uh, the calculations that happen in the background won't try to have every speaker doing everything. You know, so I've assigned roles to these. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, it's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, I found it pretty precise. Now, Keith, you mentioned something, um, and, and in fact, uh, DDA is, is bad at this. Uh, DDA, <laughs> DDA is, it will not do GLLs and DLLs, okay? Uh, yeah. So if you have, if you wanna put a VTX rig in this room, or you wanna put in somebody else's reticulated, uh, you know, touring array, this is not the program for you. Yeah, unfortunately, that won't work. Yeah, you can do that in ease. You know, go ahead and spend the 650 bucks and take a month to learn it. And all right. Or if it's in Illinois and Wisconsin or Southern California, Southern Nevada, give me a call. Maybe I'll do the model in ease for you. But uh, <laughs> by the way, you can draw the same model that you, if you start a project in DDA and you say, uh, uh, I can't do it with this. Well, you can uh, a lot of times take that same model that you already built in SketchUp, export it a different way, and now use it in ease. That's true. So if that is a if that is a concern for you, then great. Um, you can also <clears throat> import uh, to the kind of opposite of that. You know, Intellivox does have uh, DLLs for use in ease, but you can also export the, your ease model and bring it into DDA and do a, a side by side comparison that way as well. So there's there's a lot of back and forth options. Um, we're getting fairly close to, to questions. I have a couple couple last things I want to ask you, Jeff. Um, okay. You, you briefly talked before about um, what your deliverables to clients are. So, what's your process for doing that? Are you just taking screenshots, or what? What are you What are you actually providing to your clients once you're happy with the design? You have? Yeah. If I, if you go here to export file to, you can you can get a, a, a JPEG at screen resolution or a JPEG at, uh, at at a higher resolution, like a, a 300 DPI resolution. 
I just do the screen resolutions usually, and, and they're a little, they can be a little bit globby if you if you blow them up. But uh, it it gives the client the idea that um, that um, of where the sound is going in their room, and it it helps so much. I mean, people are so much more visual usually than uh, than oral that it really helps that uh, that they see where the sound is going. Uh, I'll do I'll I'll do sometimes a couple different angles. I'll sometimes do an ISO like you're seeing here where you, it looks 3D. And then I'll do a, a, a flat on view. I'll do a, a floor plan view. And, um, and you get something like this and, or, and you can, you know, zoom it to whatever size is going to work. But I'll, I'll, I'll sometimes do a couple different views. If there's any question to the client about what they're looking at, I'll do a couple different views and they can kind of piece it together. Also, uh, back to, uh, back to SketchUp for a second. I close SketchUp. Um, I'm going to reopen it because I want to show you a really cool feature of SketchUp that uh, is useful. Sometimes I will take the plots that I've done in, in DDA and um, and re-import them into the model and place them. I didn't do that for this particular job, uh, but le but let me show you. Bring up musical theater again. Oh crap! I moved it again, so I got to find it again. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Music theater two. There we go. Um, so sometimes what I'll do is I'll export this, uh, the model itself is a movie and the client gets something that looks like this. It's gonna go around from this one. And so they don't have to have SketchUp in order to know that I've drawn their room, okay? Sometimes it takes you through the wall to get to the, under the balcony or whatever, but uh, you get the idea that, um, and if I export this as an MP4 and just send them that, oftentimes they'll, uh, they'll get the idea. I really get crazy. I will then take the uh, the maps that I did of the seating planes and and bring them back into SketchUp and put them in place so that they can see those in in place as well. Wow. Okay. So what we've learned here is if you want something really cool and specific, call Jeff, not me. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a very cool trick. Um, awesome. <laughs> the only last thing I was going to ask you quickly is kind of on the opposite. Uh, end of, of the, the project process. Um, so assuming you've gone through this whole process, you've, you've built the model, you've done everything, you're happy with it, the client's bought the product, uh, they're now commissioning it. Um, are you using DDA in any way, and this may differ between you know, point source products and, and IntelliVox products, but are you using DDA when it comes time to verify you know, during the commissioning process at all? Uh, well, uh, it, I would love to. Um, uh, it, it, uh, it's a matter of, um, uh, it, sometimes I'm able to give the integrator enough, enough information. They don't need me on site for commissioning. Sure. Other times, uh, especially if it includes IntelliVox, uh, they're like, uh, yeah, this is still a little bit new to us. We're just starting to use these things. Would you please join us on site and, 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 uh, and help commission? And either way, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be there on site. The times that I am there on site, uh, uh, doing commissioning, um, I, uh, sometimes the, uh, the client has, uh, or the uh, integrator has a, has an, uh, you know, a, a smart rig or something like that they can check with. Usually not. Uh, usually they ask me for my help in tuning the system and I, um, <laughs> I'll do that. I'll do that, uh, a very rudimentary, very, uh, live sound guy kind of way. <laughs> like use these things and, use and ears, you know, look at that. Play, play reference music that I know well on, on my, my JBL studio monitors here in the in my office. Songs that I know that uh, I know exactly what, and I have a, a handful of songs. I'm sure all of you do too. You know, your favorite your favorite uh, selections that can, you know, you know, accent this or that aspect of a sound system. You play those things and, and, you, and you just, uh, you, you, get, you get a knack for playing around with it until it, uh, until it sounds good for you. Uh, I haven't had anybody complain yet, so I guess it works. All right. Well, great. Okay. Um, so I guess at this point, Laura, should we open up to questions since we're getting close to the hour? Yeah, let's do that. We had a bunch come in, um, which it looks like you started to address some of them. Um, I think that they came in to all of us with the exception of a couple. I'm going to read off one that came into me privately. Um, other than SketchUp, what other CAD programs can be imported into DDA? Okay, so uh, SketchUp's really the only one that you're going to have a direct import from. Um, 
you can build them, you can actually build within DDA as well, but I think Jeff mentioned before, it's pretty rudimentary, it's, it's very basic planes. Uh, you can also, um, if you have SketchUp Pro, you can import a CAD uh, drawing into SketchUp and then export from SketchUp. You can also, as I mentioned before, you can import directly from an Ease model. Uh, those are really, or, or CAD Acoustic as well. Uh, most people aren't really using that here. It's more of an international thing. Uh, but those are, those are really your options. And the biggest reason for that is most CAD programs are not, unless you're talking about 3D uh, CAD or, or Revit or something, most of those are, are 2D based programs um, inherently. So it's a, different, uh, it's a different format that you're dealing with. Okay, we had a question asking what version of SketchUp is needed to work with GDA. Yeah, I think Jeff answered that before. Uh, you you can. I'm using uh, SketchUp. SketchUp makes 17, uh, 2017, which is uh, which is a free download. Yeah, but you can use up to 2020. You know, whatever whatever you have uh, will work. Um, I've also I've also used uh, SketchUp on my on the Mac side of my computer. And I cannot get it to work with the uh, SU4 AC or cannot get the SU4 AC plugin to work with the Mac version, so I don't do that anymore. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. That, that's something that I used to try to do as well. And what I'd end up doing is building the model on the Mac side, uh, and uh, and then just reopening it up in SketchUp and Windows, <laughs> and exporting it there from there. Because some of the controls at least used to be a little bit different, and I, I previously found it easier to work on the Mac platform, but I've since moved on. All right, the next question is asking, is there a way to change DDA from metric to imperial units? And it seems that it doesn't really model below about 150 hertz and always shows lower output, even when using a speaker that I know goes down into the 50 hertz range. Also, it doesn't seem to show loud speaker interactions and comb filters. Ah, okay, I can take this one. Uh, first, the metric, uh, metric question, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> you got meters. Hey, hey, uh, people! Uh, all but two countries in the whole world uh, use uh, use the metric system. And sorry, uh, <laughs> the cool thing is I draw in feet and inches because that's what engineers give me here in the United States to to draw with. And I, I'll draw my SketchUp model, and the SU4AC um, export function will export it as meters. So yes. I don't have to do all those conversions. Uh, that's magical. I love that. Uh, if I, if that didn't happen, I'd be up the creek. Um, uh, in terms of uh, loudspeakers, yes, I I know what you mean. Uh, the it seems like a lot of loudspeakers that I use can get a lot louder than what the the program shows. Uh, all I can say is that there in uh, there is a maximum SPL uh, um, um, maximum gain uh, setting that's part of the CLF file. Uh, yeah. that you cannot change, and uh, and so you can actually apply more power, and you'll get a you'll get a little indication right here on screen, just above the uh, the graticule, uh, that says headroom less than zero. Um, if you want to ignore that or you know white it out, uh, <laughs> the paper, oh paper, who uses paper? Um, then you can uh, you can actually bring the power levels up to what you know that the speaker can handle. Uh, it's also important to note in the bot when you're dealing with CLF. Uh, files, you can you can either look at CLF Viewer and you will have the headroom uh, of, available as part of that file that you can view. You can also see it in DDA uh, in the lower left corner here. You can see it on Jeff's screen. Uh, depending on the product and how much gain you've applied, it'll tell you how much headroom remains on that product. And they are not all the same because not every manufacturer calculates this exactly the same. So it, it's important to keep that in mind. If you're getting this to where it's predicting down in the 60s and 70s, um, that's because you've probably got 30 or 40 dB of headroom uh, that you can make up for in your gain setting. Um, as for the other two parts of that question, um, the uh, the low frequency response down to 150, uh, you know, down once you get beneath 500 hertz, the the room modes of a room, a given room, are are likely to be more uh, m more active and more a factor of your overall system response. So uh, I don't even bother modeling down beneath uh, uh, beneath 500 hertz. Um, so yeah, that you just uh, there's no real good way, I don't think. Uh, the other uh, it's, important, it's also important to keep in mind where your loudspeaker is and what you're looking at. 
because if you're expecting 50 hertz to be traveling 100 feet and getting some kind of significant SPL, it's not going to happen. Um, you know, low frequency is going to drop off significantly and, and quickly. So if you've got a sub that's mounted up in the ceiling and you're looking 50 feet away, you're not going to be seeing 140 dB. Um, so just keep in mind the placement of it, the, the dis dissipation of whatever frequency you're looking at um, and all those kinds of things. Sub energy is a very difficult thing to calculate well. Um, so. Yeah. Um, and the other part of that question was, uh, 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 what about speaker interaction? And um, I want to point out that the only time you're going to get a nice, even, flawless, like, coverage like this is when you're using one loudspeaker, right? If I go to more more than one loudspeaker, you, ex you could expect comb filtering. Yet, you did not see that when I, when I, uh, when I did my plots. So I'm going to show it to you now. There are two ways of running calculations on this program. I've been using energy summation but you can use complex, and complex is now going to show you the phase interactions with, uh, and so I'm going to check the response using, uh, uh, let's let's take groups uh, A, B, C, go back to the Intellivox solution here, take a little bit to uh, solve this, but in a minute here, you're going to be able to see the actual complex summation, which will show you the phase uh, interaction and, and, and the little blotchiness that you'd expect in a in real world. Now, again, um, considering the reflected energy, this is all going to be mushed up, and it's going to be a lot more like the energy plot than, there you go. Yeah. What a mess. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and keep in mind that the frequency range that we're looking at is still uh, very heavy in the low frequency content. So a lot of what you're seeing here is going to be interactions in lower frequencies. Right. If we go to a specific frequency, let's take, I don't know, 3150. It's it's going to look a little different. Anyway, so uh, uh, while, while while that plots, uh, is there another question, Laura? Uh, yes, we have a question asking: Are you working on a Mac native version? Um, as Jeff is working on a Mac, as a question of history, is this based on the CAD P2? No, it's not based based on CADP2 or CADP. Uh, although I remember and used those programs way back. Uh, <laughs> No, this is not based. To, this is uh, developed by Duran Audio uh, before Duran Audio become became part of JBL. Um, and uh, I'm drawing on. I, I keep my stuff on uh, my engineering stuff on on the PC side of my Mac. Um, as as previously discussed, we could you could draw it in Mac and then, but the SU4AC um, uh, uh, export mechanism works in PC. Pretty much per PC only, I can say. Other questions? Okay, and yep, we have a question um, asking about the class that you mentioned, where where they can find that. Ah, thank you, yes. Um, the course is, do we, do we have a slide on that? I'm going to put up the thank you slide, not to say that we have to end, but I'm going to put up the thank you slide. Um, and uh, if you want to send me an email at this address or Keith, send Keith an, an email, we can send you back a link. It all starts with training, training login dot harmonpro.com that's the that's the portal to or that's the access to the uh, to the training portal uh, for Harmon professional and the course is called ad 144 alpha delta 144 and I'll be teaching that coming up in a you know a, a, maybe a couple times this month yet uh, it you won't find it because I haven't scheduled it yet but when you um, if you, if you send me an email, I can let you know when the next one is. Okay, we have another question. So far, we have covered direct sound only. Will you be discussing the modeling considerations needed to get SPI and reverberation? Um, thank you for that question. These are all great questions, by the way. Thank you very much, all of you. But uh, no, that's, that's beyond the scope of today's presentation. Uh, DDA does have the ability to uh, to let you know what the anticipated reverberation time is going to be for the um, uh, for the uh, for the room that you're you're modeling. Uh, I don't use it for that. Uh, I could, but uh, that's usually beyond what uh, my clients are asking me to do. Yeah, um, the, there is an STI uh, calculation within T in DDA uh, that you can use. Um, it's it's very dependent on all the information that you put in. 
uh, as, as is the case with ease or anything else. Um, so it's really important that if you're trying to get any kind of accurate STI calculations, uh, your model has to be very, very accurate. Otherwise, it's, it's a tool that's there that's really great for side-by-side -side comparison. Um, but don't be surprised if you just build a model and then go to SDI and uh, your SDI plot and see that you've got a, a 0.35 or something like that because your volume, the volume of the room is probably the only factor that's being taken into account at that point. Um, so yeah, you get, gotta, uh, in order for STI to be accurate, you've got to have all your surfaces defined and and what the what the and the, there has to be absorption coefficients in the program for that type of surface. So yeah, it's, uh, it's and it comes optimal. It comes yeah, to the true. whole table of uh, of uh, of surfaces that you can get pretty close. Yeah. You know, but you have to be diligent in defining your surfaces correctly in order for for uh, the STI to work. Yes, definitely STI, sure. And I, I think I, the other thing that's important is it's it's a great tool to have, but you know, in a space like this, I, I think we can pretty safely say that the RT in that room is not extremely terrible. Um, if you're looking at a cathedral, maybe this is maybe it's a tool that you should bring up and use for comparison's sake. Um, but I, oh, I think a lot oh, of yeah. The projects, yeah, a lot of the projects that we do uh, that aren't house of worship, it's it's usually not the prime concern, in my opinion. Okay, guys, it looks like that was the last question. Um, if anybody does have an additional question and they want to reach out directly to Keith or Jeff, their contact information is up on the screen right now, so be sure to jot that down. Um, and just as a reminder, this was recorded, so if there's anything that you need to go back to and review, this will be posted in several days out on our YouTube channel. So Jeff and Keith, thanks so much for presenting on this session. And everyone, thank you for attending. We really appreciate your time. For additional sessions, you can go to pro.harman.com to see our upcoming calendar of events. And um, have a great day.